In most of the whitetail's range, there are large fruit trees, especially apple trees, that are growing on the properties. Most of them were either planted by seed or by the previous landowner, not by you. They've never seen a pruning shears. In this video, I'm going to show you how to prune those mature apple trees for white-tailed deer. If you're like most people, you just want to get to cutting or snipping, but it's important to understand how apple trees produce fruit. Not all shoots, not all vegetation produces fruit. There are three main types of fruit-bearing shoots on apple trees. Most varieties that have a name associated with them, the commercially grown varieties, the ones that you would probably buy in a store, they almost all produce their fruit on fruit spurs. Fruit spurs grow only about a quarter inch a year, sometimes even less, but they are incredibly important because that's where almost all of your fruit is born, on your burr-bearing trees. On the other end of the spectrum, you have tip-bearing apple trees. That, much like it sounds, means that the fruit is produced near the end of the branches. Now, fruit is produced on three to 10 year wood. So we're not talking about last year's growth or the brand new shoots from this year, but rather that the fruit is produced on little branches or shoots rather than on these spurs. And of course, there's kind of a middle of the road kind of apple tree, which is a semi spurring tree. That means that it produces some of its fruit on spurs, but also some on those branch tips. So the important thing for you to determine when you're looking at your apple tree is what kind of fruit bearing tree is it? Does it produce on the spurs? Does it produce on the tips? Or is it somewhere in between? Now while most of the apple trees that are named varieties are spur bearing trees, I've noticed over the years that a lot of the wild apple trees and the old varieties, the ones that are growing up naturally in the wild, that they have a much higher rate of being tip producing apple trees. Once you figured out how your tree produces fruit, then you can start making some judgment calls. Unfortunately, a lot of times people unknowingly go in and just start cutting off branches and they're cutting off the fruit bearing portion of the tree and that sets the tree back oftentimes several years before you'll even see a lot of fruit. Another thing that's important to understand is that, like most things related to white-tailed deer, everything is driven by the sun. And so sun is critical to be able to produce good fruit on an apple tree. You need to consider what is on the southern face of your apple tree. That's most important. If there are trees that are blocking the southern root, you're going to minimize the ability of that tree to produce fruit. This cherry tree is not doing so well, but it's also blocking all the sunlight for all of these apple trees that are growing to the north of it. So I'd cut that one down because it's blocking the sunlight from the south. You'll notice if you're looking at an old tree that its thickest growth is almost always on the southern side. Sometimes it's so distinct that there's hardly anything growing on the northern side because there's no sunlight or trees may be blocking out the sun from reaching that tree if it's growing on the edge of a field or woods. So opening up the southern end of your apple tree that may be felling a tree or pulling back some kind of shrub or vegetation that blocks the sun is really important. Research shows that somewhere between 28 to 32 apple leaves are needed to produce the necessary energy through photosynthesis to make one apple. Of course, I don't expect you to go and count the leaves on a tree, but you get the idea where there's a balancing act where you need good vegetation to produce the energy, but not too much vegetation because you want fruit. 
When I prune trees for folks that want the apples for eating purposes, I prune them differently than I do for trees that are being grown for wildlife. And the difference is that when somebody wants to eat the apples, I want to lower the height of the tree as much as possible so that they can reach the fruit and maybe only use a small step ladder to be able to reach the top of it. Whereas trees that are being grown for wildlife, I don't care if the apples fall from 30 feet up because the deer aren't that picky. Further, I will leave branches on, especially down lower on trees that are being pruned for wildlife because deer like to browse apple trees. Whereas in an orchard where the fruit is being grown to be eaten by people, I want those branches pruned off because I don't want deer to be attracted to that tree any more than they already are. Really what I want in my apple tree for deer is that it produces the most poundage of fruit. So if some of them are wrinkled, some of them have a little rotten spot on the side, they're scarred up or whatever, I don't care, that's okay, because deer aren't that picky. Whereas human beings have been conditioned, especially with the apples that are sold in the grocery store, that, that it has to look beautiful, the apple itself. You'll be tempted, if you're like most folks, to get out your chainsaw if you have one, because it's quick and, well, you have one and you want to run it. But it's best to use hand tools in most cases when you're pruning trees because you don't want to have huge areas that the branches actually pull the bark away, which opens that tree up for disease. So I like to use a loppers. I like to use my hand pruners. And a saw or two is really handy. This is an arborist saw. It actually has openings in it so that the sawdust actually comes out much easier than a normal saw. I like to have a smaller saw to get into the little nooks and crannies, the areas that are hard for a bigger saw to reach. The tools that you use when you're pruning an apple tree can make and break what you're doing. The good thing is you don't have to spend a lot of money buying the top of the line equipment. Basic equipment from your local hardware store will generally do the job. This is certainly the case as long as you keep a couple of things in mind. First of all, make sure that you choose the right shears. There are two main kinds of shears available for purchase today. Bypass shears and anvil shears. They cut differently and it's critical that you get the right pair for the job. Bypass shears have two blades that pass by one another. They cause very little damage when used appropriately to the branches that you're pruning off. Anvil shears, on the other hand, and I haven't used these for years, actually press the knife or the cutting part right into the anvil. If you think about an anvil, that's what a blacksmith used to hammer out metal to form and shape it. And so you're actually crushing that branch when you're pruning it using an anvil shears. Really, the only productive use for anvil shears is to cut out dead wood. Otherwise, I would stick to the bypass shears all of the time. Then it's critical that you make sure that you keep your shears in tip-top shape. And the most important thing here is to make sure that your blade is sharp. Lots of times people will actually realize that their shears is becoming dull and throw out the pair of shears altogether and go buy a new one. But I've had this pair of shears and cut literally hundreds, if not more than a thousand apple trees with this pair by sharpening the blade when it becomes dull. This is simple to do with an ordinary file. When you're sharpening your shears, make sure you choose the right side of the blade on your shears to sharpen. You notice that the one side right here is completely flat. That area you want to remain flat so that it's flush with the other blade that it bypasses. On the other side, you have a tapered blade, and that's the side that you want to sharpen. And all you have to do is take your file, hold it firmly, just want to apply even pressure and don't overdo it. Make sure that you're trying to follow the 
angle that has already been established in that blade. You can check how sharp it is, but be careful because oftentimes it's just like a knife and it can actually cut your finger. And if you see that there are any nicks in the metal, just go over them slightly again. You will be surprised how sharp just a little bit of filing can make your shears and how much easier that makes for you to have clean cuts while you're pruning an apple tree. The other important tool in your toolbox for pruning is a, a saw. I use an arborist saw that has these little openings that help to clean out living wood because living wood has a tendency to clog up the teeth over time. These openings actually allow the sawdust to fall to the ground. You compromise a little bit because you don't have as many teeth per inch of cut, so you're not able to cut quite as quickly, but it more than makes up for itself because it's eliminating the sawdust. But no matter what saw you use, it should be sharp. And much like the shears, you can use a simple file to sharpen the teeth of the saw so that you make nice clean cuts. And so what I'll do is I'll put my file in here, sharpen up one side. You see the new metal there that's being worn away by the file. Don't overdo it. See how that's completely even, that new uh, color of metal. And then I move up to the next one that is along that line. And then what I'll do is I'll flip it over on the other side and I'll work the edge going the other way. So for example, in here, One more thing in maintaining your tools. Usually on your saws, you have a handle that's attached to the blade. And it's often attached, whether it's a wooden or a plastic handle in this case, by some kind of screws. Make sure that those stay tight because otherwise, as you work over time, it loosens those screws up and you can actually lose them. And unfortunately, I've had this experience and it can put your pruning operation at a standstill in an instant. Likewise, on a shears like this, this spring between the two handles. And you just want to make sure that every once in a while you grease that so that it operates the way that it should, so that it actually returns to its open position. Of course, if you happen to prune and you get dirt or water on your tools, it's best to wipe them down and keep them clean so that they last you a long time. Just a few more things before I can get you pruning. Branches that are growing between 30 and 60 degrees in relationship to the ground are the best apple bearing branches on your tree. If you go below that, you have this swooping effect of the branch and the weight of the apples can actually snap that branch right off. Vertical shoots are not very good at bearing fruit. So you wanna shoot for somewhere in between 30 and 60 degrees. Now when it comes to these old apple trees, a lot of times you're left with what you have. You can't do much about it. But if I have the choice, I want to choose the branches that are between 30 and 60 degrees because they're usually the strongest. They form the strongest bond to the main trunk and they also bear the most fruit. And lastly, the fewer cuts that you make on the tree, the better. It's better to make one big cut than to make 10 or 12 little cuts whenever possible. A lot of times we want the tree to look beautiful. But the goal, especially on an old raggedy tree, is to produce fruit for deer. So keep that in mind. In any one given year, you can't cut back more than 25% of the tree's growth above the ground, or it will not fruit because it sends this message to the root system that there's something wrong in the branches up above. And that forces the tree into vegetative growth mode rather than fruiting mode. So don't be tempted to try to make it look perfect the first year, especially if it hasn't seen a pruning shears in a long, long time.